people walk through a door with expectations about what the church should supply for them. And those expectations are not biblical. They're not anywhere to be seen in the Word of God. And so, like for instance, if, if young people, if a family comes with you, well, what have you got for our young people? Well, we've got this program, they go on this trip, they go on that trip, but, but what about the Word of God? Well, well, well they can't, they'll look at that, maybe just a little bit here, you know, and, and, and for me, it's lost its value as to what the church, the church is not to supply entertainment for all of these yeah. families and all of these kids. The church is supposed to teach them the word and the spiritual dynamic of what God wants us to impart to them. If you don't mind, can I read this quote you gave me? It's a quote Mike heard somewhere and I just thought it, it fitted in. He said, people come to church with a worldly itch and they want the church to scratch it. <laughs> Is that cool or what? That's not the function of the church. And it's the same with adults. Adults come to church and they look what they can be part of, what they can do, where they can go, what trip they can go on, and how many you know, socials they can be involved in. That's not what we're supposed to scratch. We're supposed to give them the Word of God. Amen. And it's the Word of God that we need to incorporate into a worship service that we come on a Sunday morning. That should be the focus, the Word of God. Everything else around that, whether it's prayer, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, is all that the Bible says we should incorporate in a worship service. So we're here this morning, and we're here to open up this Word. Where we're at today is, is Second Peter, and uh, it's a scripture that uh, is coming to the end of, of chapter uh, 1 of Second Peter. Um, and as we'll unfold these verses today, we'll look at the witness and the Word and how important both of them are. But as we close out the second part, it's the word that is so uh, strong that Peter wants us to get hold of today. So let's look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. And it says this, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven. For we were with him on the holy mountain, and we have something more sure, the prophetic word, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Let's just pray, shall we? Father, this morning, I just want to thank you that we can come into this place and worship you as we do that uh, with our voices singing to you. Uh, we worship you as we give to you. Lord, I'm thankful for how you bless each and every one of us. That, Lord, we can utilize uh, those resources to reach our community. Lord, I'm thankful that we can open up the Word today as we uh, honor you by what you've left us, by the inspired Word of God that comes to us. These are the words, the thoughts. This is the voice of God speaking to us as we look at this every single week. As we open up this Word, help us not to close our ears. Lord, help us to be attentive this morning as we're listening to the voice of God together. So Holy Spirit, teach us today, we pray, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So last week we heard how Peter wanted to remind those in the churches 
that, that he was writing to them, and also as he wrote to them, he's writing to us, uh, because we're the ones that now follow those disciples. He wanted them to know how important it was to remember the things that he'd already taught them. Remember, we talked about remember. Remember the things. And also that he was stirring them up and telling them that very soon he was about to depart this life. And that he was passing the baton. Got it? Did I get it? The baton. See? I, I'm actually taking American lessons. You know? I'm, I'm learning American. I'm going back to school to learn American. But, you know. But he was passing this baton of ministry onto them. And that they were the ones now who were going to carry this message on. And if they were the ones then, as they passed that message on through the centuries, we are now recipients of that message. And we're the ones, I, I challenge you at the end of the message last week, are we going to take that baton? Are we going to say, yes, I'll take it and run with the message? of what Peter was asking them in his first letter and his second letter. And so now we're looking at this uh, second letter, we're in the first chapter of it, and, and the first letter itself was full of things, full of instructions, full of reminders. If you remember, I went through from the first chapter of the first letter and went through some of the points, the bullet points of how important it was. And now in these verses he continues the teaching. And again to see how important this witness is and how the word is. And the word is so important as we've been talking about. As it says in verse 19 about the word being a lamp shining in a dark place. This is a very dark place right now. It's a very dark place. I'm going to talk about that a bit later on. And so when it comes to talking about our faith, which we've talked about, precious faith, the faith, if we know there are those who have lived at the time of Jesus, those apostles, those disciples, who've seen the miracles, they've heard him speak, they've had experience of his power and his majesty and honor and glory, they've seen him die on the cross, and they've also then seen him alive and resurrected, Surely, when it comes to believing in a faith, to know that there were those people there with him, it makes it all the more believable and totally acceptable for you and I to say, well, if he was seen by all of these people, they've passed this down through the centuries. Wow, I think that's worth believing. That's part of faith, that the witness of those in those days was that powerful. So first of all this morning, continuing now on that theme, I'm going to see how important the witness is. It's really important that the witness is something that we grasp hold of. Verse 16, for we, that's the apostles, did not follow cleverly devised myths where we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we, the apostles, were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We, we all, were eyewitnesses of his majesty. You know, an eyewitness in court is one of the highest forms of testimony you can get in any trial. You know, they go through trials and they, they present this and they present that. It might be a document, it might be it. The, the final crowning glory comes when they say, I've got a final witness. This is an eyewitness. I want to bring this witness in. And it's usually the eyewitness that swings the trial swings the verdict in court and this is what Peter is saying here in this verse 16 we were eyewitnesses to Jesus Christ the definition of an eyewitness is this a person who has personally seen something happen 
and can give a first-hand description of it. The apostles saw Jesus and they saw what Jesus did and what happened when he was around and they can give a first-hand description of what took place. That was what Peter was saying. And so when we talk about eyewitness in, in the court of law, when this person is asked to give evidence in a trial, they do so under oath. And under oath, they're under penalty of imprisonment if they lie. That's the nature of the oath that they take. And the fact that there will be consequences if they lie means that it would be very unlikely for someone to lie as it could cost them their freedom. And so it was with the apostles. They were the ones who saw those around Jesus Christ. Why would they say they witnessed who Jesus was and what he did when it would have been easier to deny it? I know Peter did at one point when he was around the campfire. He denied Jesus. But we know that when he was filled with the Holy Spirit from Pentecost, when he saw Jesus on the beach and he met Jesus face to face, it was then a different story for the rest of his life. Admitting to being an eyewitness cost all the apostles, apart from one, their lives. Because they'd seen Jesus and because they were filled with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, it gave them the courage to speak the truth, to be his witnesses, to put their lives on the line and then ultimately die for him. So what was the eyewitness evidence here that they say they saw with their own eyes? I know there was hundreds and hundreds of things they could have talked about. And what it's saying in this verse 16 is they didn't just believe in myths about Jesus. And by the way, as we look at it next week, we're going to look at false teachers. There was false teachers out then. There was false teachers teaching about other things. They weren't the things that, that Jesus brought to the attention. They were myths. And that's what Peter is saying. It says here, we were eyewitnesses of the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and of his majesty. And then the New Living Translation says this, we have seen his majestic splendor with our own eyes. They went like that, seen it. <laughs> seen it. While all the apostles were eyewitnesses, we are, uh, they are referred to we, we, as I said at the beginning, verses 16 and 19, we, we, the apostles. But there's a verse here, verse 18, Peter makes reference to a more specific event that he, that he describes. And when he says we, he means Peter, James, and John. That's the we of verse 18. Look at verse 18. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven for we were with him on the holy mountain we were with him and we know who was with him on the holy mountain and that's the holy mountain of transfiguration in Matthew 17 and we know that he took Peter, James and John if you want to read that go to Matthew 17 and you'll see what happened on that holy mountain they also heard the voice of God. That's why it's recorded here. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And it says the Holy Spirit descended upon him as of a dove. Again, a picture of the Trinity. Jesus on the mountain. God's voice and the Holy Spirit. All together in union, in communion with Jesus Christ being transfigured. The fact that this event, like many of the others in the life of Jesus, was seen by a number of witnesses serves to strengthen the credibility of their testimony. 
in the context of the lives they lived, the suffering they endured, the scripture they left behind, for me there's only one reasonable conclusion. They were in fact eyewitnesses of his majesty. And I have every confidence that if they say they saw Jesus, I believe them. For somebody to be willing to die for that very thing, I'm good with that. The witness was important. That's the first thing. But even more important this morning is the second thing we're going to touch on is the word. When it comes to what we believe. And this is our main foundation of who we are in our faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. Where we get our faith from? From the word. I don't know about you, if you've read a book and you, you can pick a book up and you think, wow, this is fantastic. Um, but it's, it's, all, it's a fairy tale. It, it's some of the things that they talked about on the video. It, it's not really real. It's kind of very fantasy. And there's some books, the book, for instance, the Bible, because you know where the source comes from, that you know is a different feel when you're reading it. And that it's more powerful. And it's God's word. And so verse 19 says this. And we have something more sure. The prophetic word. To which you will do well to pay attention. Listen up. That's what Peter said. Listen up. Pay attention. This is the word. To pay attention as to a light shining in a dark place. It's so important that we get what the Word of God is. And by the way, this is referencing here the prophecies of the Old Testament. Why? Because they didn't have the New Testament manuscripts at that time. They were in the process of, of listening to God and writing them. These prophecies pointed to Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of the coming Messiah. As they witnessed who Jesus was and Jesus himself saying who he was, I believe it made them all the more sure, verse 19, of their faith to such an extent they preached this truth wherever they went. Look at Acts chapter 17 with me. Uh, this is uh, Luke in, in Acts talking about Paul and his preaching. So, uh, Acts chapter 17, verses 2 and 3. And it says this, And Paul, when as it was his custom, it, it says in the verse 1, it, it, it got into the, to the synagogue, Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. Well, there's a lot in those two verses. And Paul went into the synagogue, as was his custom, three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. It doesn't say he did a number of other things inside those Sabbath day meetings. It says for three Sundays he reasoned with them from the scripture. There's another place in Acts where it says he preached all night. And that's when the young man fell out the window because he fell asleep. I think some of you would fall asleep after 45 minutes, never mind, all night. But he preached the word. That's how important the word was. He reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. And so as he was preaching from the scriptures, it was the Old Testament scriptures that he was preaching from. Because Paul himself hadn't written anything at that time. 
And so the Old Testament scriptures, as we know, point forward to Jesus. And when Jesus came in the middle of the old and the new, it's like Jesus was stretching between the two of them to bring them together. The Old Testament is so important to point people to Jesus. And the New Testament is so important to point people back to Jesus and to him in the future because he's coming back again. And that's why... The Old Testament scriptures were being fulfilled in their presence. As we now read in the New Testament scriptures, the records of all the apostles' journeys, all what they experienced concerning Jesus the Messiah coming the first time, have now come true. Their experience, the truth of the Old Testament prophecies firsthand. They're alive, they're preaching, because they've seen the Messiah. And by the way, the New Testament prophecies concerning Jesus' second coming, which are talked about all the way through the New Testament, I 100% definitely believe that they're going to come true. 100%. So how can I be sure of that? Well, look at verse 20 and 21 this morning. Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Yes, we understand men had to be the conduits where God would speak to them and they would write it down. They may have written it down, but it was the Holy Spirit who inspired the writing. You could say it was like the Holy Spirit dictated the letter to them. It's like the Holy Spirit said, Peter, get a pen and paper. <clears throat> I'm going to speak to you right now. And that's how this, for me, is the difference between a book written by a human being and a book inspired by the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is breathed out by God. Is God breathed? Is God inspired? That's the interpretation of that verse. All scripture, not just some or a bit, but all scripture inspired by God. All the inspired word of God as it says in verse 19, is like a light that shines in a dark place. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you think we're living in a dark place right now? I think it's darker by the minute. It's interesting, the word he uses for dark place means murky. It's murky. It's a picture of a, of a dank cellar or a dismal swamp. It's like a murky swamp. Well, as one commentator said, human history began in a lovely garden. But that garden today is a murky swamp. That's a good analogy of what it was to what it is now. We need the word. This word of God is more valuable than it's ever been before. If we're living in this murky swamp, I'm going to quote something here now, it's not new. We need to drain the swamp. Seriously. The spiritual swamp is getting deeper and deeper. And you and I need to stand on this word of God and come against this dark world like we've never done before. It's more valuable than it's ever been before. They're trying to ban it. They're trying to stop us reading it. They're taking it out of the courtrooms, the schoolrooms. And as we'll see next week, there's false teachers teaching from everything else but the Word of God. They talk of, you know, good stories. 
you know, good listening materials that they, they use and borrow. You know, it's good to have helps and concordances and different things that come uh, from many intelligent sources because we don't think we know it all. Nobody can. I've said this before. We have to have help from theologians a lot higher than who we are. I, I look at many, many resources to help with the study of the Word of God. And I do that on a weekly basis. And so when we come to this Word, we need that help to come into there. But let me just tell you, it's not those books are the main important things. The main important thing is the Word of God. And I believe as we study the Word of God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, He gives us insight as to what we're looking at and to the meaning. And so this Word of God needs to come into this dark, damp place that we're in. And so as we'll see next week, there's false teachers. They're out there. They were out there at the time of Jesus. They're out there now. They're going to be out there until Jesus comes back. But we must read this word. We must be in Bible study. And by the way, the Bible studies are going to start again in August. The August ones are going to be four here. And then the beginning of September in the homes. We're going to open up Bible study again in home Bible studies. We'll have sign-up sheets ready to go uh, by the time the September ones come around. But we need to be in that word. It's for everyone. For the intelligent, the rich, the poor, the ordinary people, the upper class, middle class, lower class, whatever class. The prince, the pauper. Everybody. And as Peter was stirring us up last week in the, the message that we heard last week, he's doing the same again to, today. He told them not to be lethargic, complacent. He told them to stop compromising to the world's standards and accepting unbiblical ideologies. Well, you might say, that's a little bit far-fetched. They, they, they can't be false teachers, you know, accepting unbiblical ideologies. I'm afraid there are. I heard one uh, man tell me about his son this week who's left the church. He joined the church because... This pastor had started a new fellowship because the pastor himself thought where he was at were teaching unscriptural things. And he began a church. And so a number of people began to join this pastor at the church. But since then, a number of people have left that church. Why? Because this pastor has started to behave in an unbiblical way. How so? He married a gay couple. He promoted Black Lives Matter. A number of things that we know are against the word of God. And so when you look into those things which are unbiblical, and you think, can a pastor do that? Yeah, of course he can. A pastor can do all those kind of things and more, and think they're still doing what God wants. I just need to tell you again, this is not a wide scoping reading material. In this word it says, wide is the road that leads to destruction, but narrow is the gate that leads to eternity. This is a narrow gate, book of ethics, book of standards, that we have to live by. We either live by them or we don't. It's, it's not an either or situation in terms of take any one from ten options. It's not. We either stand and live and learn and, and go by the word of God or we don't. It's a narrow road. I've got a picture in my office of that text. And two roads that it shows. And the wide road has got all kinds of evil things on the road that people are involved in. And there's a picture to the right of it of the little narrow gate. And by the way, there's thousands on this wide road. 
and it shows the picture of the narrow gate that leads to heaven and there's one or two people on that narrow road. That's the standard that we have to live by. That's what needs to come back into our society. It needs to come back into our churches to start with. Might sound odd, but it does. And then it needs to be in our schools. It needs to go into our colleges. It needs to go into our workplaces. It needs to begin to ripple out. And how does that begin? It begins with you and I. It's the only place it can begin. That's how important it is. We need to wake up. Be reminded of the things. Those things that Peter reminded us of last week. We look back at his first letter and it showed us many, many things. And that letter, this second letter, and all the other letters and the, all the other writings together paint the picture for you and I. To, today the church of God needs to get back to the Bible. That's the standard of God. That's the mind of God. That's the way of God and how he wants us to live in this dark world. We need to wake up to what's happening. Again, I heard a quote that one commentator said, a sleeping church is the devil's playground. Sleeping church is the devil's playground. Because in Matthew 13, it was while men slept that the enemy came in and sowed in some tears. Sowed destruction. I'm going to close with this Psalm 119. Very familiar psalm says this thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path thy word nothing else thy word in this dark world that we live in the only light that you and I need to hold high and, and bring it above our heads is the word of God God is the light of the world. His word is the light that shines in a dark place. Will you let your light shine this morning? We used to sing that with our kids. This is the light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. We sang it. Do we believe it? Is that something we can pick up again and hold high and begin to shine? Only you can answer that question. The witness and the word is so powerful this morning. Let's pray.